So to begin with tonight, I've invited Rick Feinberg. He's the emeritus editor of Sky and Telescope magazine. I first met Rick in maybe in the 80s in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we were there for an American Astronomical Society meeting. We've been friends since. And now that he is the media director for the American Astronomical Society, nice step up. I would like to introduce Rick Feinberg. Thank you, David. OK, the earliest roots of Sky and Telescope go back to 1929 in New York City. The Amateur Astronomers Association of New York City, which is still around, you can see their website, um, they, um, they started putting out a little uh, flyer called Amateur Astronomer. And a few years later, when the Hayden Planetarium started up, um, you know, it's like the fourth big public planetarium in the United States. This is what it looked like before they tore it down and put up the big thing with the giant sphere and the glass, uh, the glass cube. Um, the, uh, the Hayden Planetarium started a newsletter called Monthly Bulletin. By 1936, it uh, into one publication, uh, which became The Sky, the magazine of cosmic news published out of the Hayden Planetarium. Now, this is Charlie Federer. We saw a picture. I think we saw this very same picture of him before. Um, this is his wife, Helen Spence Federer. The two of them were, uh, were the unit around which uh, Sky and Telescope um, became you know, became a publication. They formed Sky Publishing Corporation. Uh, you'll notice that they were, uh, when they took over the sky, what happened was the uh, planetarium couldn't, they couldn't deal with it anymore. They asked Charlie if he would take it over. Uh, and he said, sure, but he was inheriting this thing that was losing uh, a rather large sum of money at the time. Remember, this is the 1930s. Meanwhile, halfway across the country in Ohio, um, Perkins Observatory started publishing a little, uh, magazine called The Telescope. And its editor was Harlan Stetson. And the reason that Harvard gets involved in the story is that Harlan Stetson moved to Harvard just a few years after starting The Telescope. And they, there was a club here called the Bond Astronomical Club that was uh, affiliated with the observatory. And Harvard, the observatory, and the amateurs involved in the Bond Astronomical Club basically uh, took the telescope under their wing. So, so we now have the sky being published in New York City, the telescope being published in Cambridge, Mass, and the World's Fair in 1939, all this futuristic stuff happening in New York City. And uh, Harlow Shapley came down to New York for it, and he met Charlie Federer there. And this is the origin of the phrase, the happy accident, which David used as the title for the, uh, for the presentation tonight. Um, Shapley and Charlie Federer were just talking informally about the two magazines, and the subject came up that maybe they could merge at some point. Uh, neither one of them was making any money. Uh, maybe if they were merged, uh, the two of them could do something uh, together. But nothing actually happened at that point. It was not until a couple years later that Menzel, who never really wanted to be editing a magazine anyway, he's a professional astronomer doing research, he gave up the magazine. Uh, the person who was here at Harvard who had actually been doing most of the work since Donald Menzel didn't want to do it, uh, Leo Goldberg, he left, and suddenly there was a crisis. There was nobody to edit the telescope. Shapley remembered his conversation. He contacted Charlie Federer and said, why don't you and Helen bring the sky up to Cambridge and merge it with the telescope, and uh, we'll have a new magazine called Sky and Telescope. And that's where it came from. Okay, so you see they took the sky lettering for that, the telescope lettering for that, and that was the new logo, Sky Plus Telescope. Now, of course, this all happened right before World War II broke out. So the timing wasn't exactly great. But Charlie wrote, this is a better picture of Charlie. That's, uh, that's, he's looking at an early issue of the magazine. That's what he looked like when I first met him in the 80s. Um, that's what he looked what, like in the 30s. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> that's what happens when you lose all your hair young. Anyway, that's, that's the Charlie I remember. He wrote, it is expected, this is the first issue, 1941, that Sky and Telescope will endure for many years to come and play an important part in the development of the layman's interest in astronomy. And I think based on what David has said and what you saw in the video, uh, I think we would agree that that has exactly been what happened. I also notice in this very first editorial that he talks a little bit about um, the conflict between astronomy and astrology. Boy, am I glad that's been solved. <laughs> okay. 
So, uh, so Sky and Telescope started in Cambridge in 1941, and it's been here ever since. Um, in 1954, uh, we'd outgrown the space under the 15-inch refractor. Uh, the business staff moved to Kittredge Hall uh, on the main campus at Harvard. Actually, I'm not sure it's the main campus. It's where Harvard University Press is located. Um, and that building also housed a project called Moonwatch, uh, which involved amateur astronomers uh, looking for Earth orbiting satellites. Remember, this is the 1950s now. Um, uh, we knew uh, the Russians were going to launch something. We knew we were going to be launching something. Uh, at the time, nobody knew how to uh, predict exactly where the satellites were going to be. And amateur observers in, um, who were um, recruited by Sky and Telescope and who were trained on, in the pages of the magazine actually created this uh, huge uh, core of observers who were looking at satellites, reporting their data to the professionals, and enabling uh, professionals to track the early satellites. So that was an early example of Sky and Telescope's involvement uh, in professional amateur collaboration, and that was based here at Harvard. OK, so, <laughs> so a little bit later in the 50s, we really had no room left. Um, Charlie bought this lot on Bay State Road, which is just a 10-minute walk from here, and he built this little uh, one-story building, which became the fulfillment office. Fulfillment is uh, magazine speak for uh, you know, where the subscription people work. Uh, where that the yeah, that's out yeah. by Fresh Pond. Yeah. They acquired this house. They acquired two houses across the street. Uh, by the late 50s, everybody was on Bay State Road. Okay. Coincidentally, 1956 is the year that I was born. So, and Sky and Telescope was there for the next 50 years. All right. Um, Dennis mentioned Joe Ashbrook. Uh, he said in the video that, that Joe started in 1953. Um, my reading of the history is that he started in 64, but it doesn't matter. Whenever he started, he was there for a long time. Um, and uh, he was basically the, uh, he had the title editor. Charlie retained the, art, the title editor in chief, but Joe was really uh, the guy in charge for many years after Charlie was getting up in years. Uh, when Charlie officially retired in the mid-70s, Joe Ashbrook became uh, the editor-in-chief. But as Dennis already explained, he died only five years later. And that's when Leif Robinson, who had been at the magazine since the early 60s, became the editor-in-chief. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that is true uh, for all the editors of Sky and Telescope, all the editors-in-chief, even including Bob, is that uh, we've never just brought somebody in from outside. Uh, the, the new editor of Sky and Telescope has always been somebody who's worked there before, in most cases, for many, many years. Okay. Meanwhile, Charlie died in 1999, and Leif, sadly, uh, is not here with us tonight because he died earlier this year. I became the editor when Leif retired. And now I want to get away from boring history and have a little fun, uh, talk about some of the things that, uh, that I think are, are kind of neat. Uh, we introduced an, our first new logo in 1980. Uh, we not so affectionately call that the spaghetti logo. Um, and that, that was after 41 years of the original. Then in 1991, uh, getting ready for our 50th anniversary, we uh, launched this new logo, which, has, uh, which we still have, uh, though it's changed fonts a little bit. But when we introduced the new logo, the red field, um, we got a lot of guff from readers. Uh, they wanted us to go back to the old logo. And they did not mean this one. They meant the original, all right? They meant the original. And I noticed that, uh, that the current staff has incorporated the original logo into the 70th year uh, anniversary graphic, which I think is cool, all right? Now, here's an interesting coincidence. Uh, in the current issue, um, Barbara Meredith, Charlie's daughter, describes uh, growing up with the magazine. And she mentions that the Federers had a summer place in Danbury, New Hampshire. Well, Dennis and I were shocked when we read this from Barbara, because uh, I've had a place in Danbury, New Hampshire for 11 years. And I never knew that Charlie did. I never knew that. What a coincidence. All these places where you might go to have your summer fun and, and build an observatory, and two of the five editors of Sky and Telescope both ended up in Danbury, New Hampshire. Quite remarkable. Charlie must have known that even 50 years later, it would still be really dark there. All right. Now we come to the bloopers section, OK? Uh, David mentioned big telescopes, grinding your own mirrors, making behemoths 12 inches, 24 inches, 30 inches. You can buy a 50-inch Dobsonian telescope today. A Dobsonian is basically a huge light bucket. It's a big telescope. 
on a cheap, compact, easy to build mount, um, uses cheap materials. Uh, well, these days, I mean, you can spend a fortune on a Dobsonian because, of course, whenever you build something cheap and easy, somebody else comes along and figures out how to make it a lot more expensive so they can make a big profit on it. But in any case, uh, Dobson brought his idea for building big, cheap telescopes, essentially, you know, by the hundreds or thousands. He brought that to Sky and Telescope and was told, no, nope, your shortcuts can hardly lead to satisfactory instruments of the kind most amateurs want. Uh, porthole glass, cheap glass, makeshift wooden alt azimuth mountings, you know, crude test methods are no longer suitable. We would not want to publish your material. And of course, what is the single most popular and most often recommended telescope today? The Dobsonian. <laughs> All right? So that was not the smartest thing we ever did. And John Dobson, who, he's still with us, right? I mean, he's like, he's pushing 100, okay? He, he's literally and figuratively a telescope guru, okay? Now, uh, doing it once wasn't good enough. We had to do it twice. Uh, when Phil Sadler, who's, a, who's a, you know, he's here at Harvard and has been here since the mid-'80s, uh, he's a, a you know, luminary in the field of astronomy education and astronomy education research, Phil invented the Star Lab Inflatable Planetarium. He brought it to Sky and Telescope in his car, and he wanted to set it up and demonstrate it. But the editors told him they thought it was a crazy idea. It would never take off. So instead, you know, all these years later, Almost every school district has one. There are three or four competing models. Uh, they're fully digital now. You, you, know, you can produce inside of one of these inflatable planetariums what you can do at the old Hayden Planetarium in New York City. Here's one of my favorites. Guillermo Aro, a Mexican astronomer who we killed off in 1980 <laughs> by publishing his obit, even though he still had eight more years in him. <laughs> All right? I don't, know, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Eight years later, we published his obit again. <laughs> All right? OK, this was the one that was talked about. This is a scan of my copy. I actually received the Halley is Back sticker on my, on my magazine and wondered, what's going on? If you peel it back, you see, well, you would have seen March two, uh, 1985. <coughs> this is one of the correctly printed issues. Halley Gate, or Sticker Gate, if you wish. All right? I wonder how much that'll go for on eBay. I'm going to find out. All right, and then here's one. Uh, this is one that's uh, where we, we see an example of Sky and Telescope uh, go, having an impact much broader than just among professionals or amateur astronomers, but actually uh, a cultural phenomenon of a sort. What's a blue moon? Okay, anybody, what, what, is, what do you think of when, when somebody says, what, how do you define a blue moon? Second full moon in a month, anybody else? Yeah, sec second, second full moon, yeah, something very rare. That's true. What, once in a blue moon means something very rare. But this idea that, that what it means is it's the second full moon in a month, which is a phenomenon that will occur very rarely, only when you have a full moon on the first or second of the month, and then you have another one on the 30th or the 31st, if the month has enough days. That originated in Sky and Telescope in 1946 as a misreading of the Farmer's Almanac. Okay. We published an article by a guy who was reading the Farmer's Almanac, misinterpreted uh, some techno babble that he came across in there and said the, sec the a blue moon is a second full moon in a month. And that has become the standard definition, according to most people. But that mistake, it, it, it was traced to a mistake in Sky and Tell. What the Farmer's Almanac really said was that every now and then, there are four full moons in a season instead of the usual three. And the third is the blue moon. But, you know. That's gone. <laughs> That's long gone. Long gone. All right? So very quickly, Sky and if, if somebody says, you know, talk to me about Sky and Telescope, the history, what have you seen at Sky and Telescope? We've seen you know, a lifetime of evolution of amateur and professional astronomy. For our 50th anniversary, we published a series of essays about the, the key moments in astronomy during the 50 years up to that point that Sky and Telescope had been around. And so I'm just going to you know, quickly rip through these. You know. The, the Hale 200-inch telescope and the early photographs of galaxies and things like that. 1950s is when we had the first satellites and the development of radio astronomy, the first opportunity to start looking at the universe at wavelengths that we can't see with our own eyes. Okay. 1960s, of course, the moon landings, first human footfalls on another world, 
the discovery of the cosmic background radiation that Alan writes about in Sky and Telescope in the mornings, uh, the discovery of quasars, pulsars, all these new phenomena that nobody had ever imagined. 1970s, so much happened, we had to have two pages. Uh, the, planet, the golden age of planetary exploration, our first close-up views of most of the planets in the solar system. Okay. 1980s was the uh, discovery of uh, the perfect black body radiation, the perfect thermal background of the cosmic microwave radiation, telling us that the universe really did begin in a very hot, dense state, uh, the COBE satellite. Also, the first large-scale surveys of galaxies that, that revealed that the structure of the universe, when looked at on the largest scales, looks like the froth of uh, soap bubbles, or maybe the, you know, a sponge with, with uh, filaments and, and uh, sheets and, and holes in the middle. Very unusual and unexpected. 90s was the era of ginormous telescopes. The Hale 5 meter or 200 inch telescope had been the reigning uh, largest telescope in the world for, for several, for four or five decades. Uh, there's the question about whether you count the 6 meter in Russia, but that never really worked very well. But now we have 8 meters and 10 meter telescopes. And the Hubble Space Telescope, of course, uh, which ushered in the era of, uh, of large, high resolution space telescopes, uh, also not only optical wavelengths, but at infrared gamma ray, et cetera. So uh, the magazine has witnessed uh, an incredible growth and, and incredible change in the history of astronomy, amateur and professional. Um, and the, you know, we literally live in a different universe than we did when the magazine started. Um, I write an essay about this in the, in the current issue, the 70th anniversary issue. So I've taken us kind of up to the 90s. Bob's going to be talking about uh, Sky and Telescope today, but first, my colleague Dennis Tachiko, uh, who I'm not sure, but he may have been around. Were you around when it started? <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. Uh, Dennis, <laughs> you know, I was I was going to put the years that we worked there, and I thought I don't I, I'm not sure Dennis's start date was recorded. But anyway, uh, so Dennis is going to talk to you about the amateur side, the equipment side, the hobby side, and then Bob will come back and pick up where the magazine is today, and hopefully a little bit about where it's going in the future. I uh, hope I haven't used up more than my allotted time. I'm turning it over to who? Dennis, I think, yes. right? All right. Do you want my red pointer? OK. Well, you Thank you. Up, yeah. Our next speaker is Dennis DeChico. Dennis DeChico observes. He builds. He has an engineering background. I'm still amazed at the work that came out of his doghouse observatory that's only four feet wide and eight feet long. Dennis, you could have bought just one more sheet of plywood and made it six feet wide. But he sees the sky in his astrophotos in a very different way than most astrophotographers see it. They're iconic. They're beautiful. They're recordings of the, the sky that most astrophotographers would never attempt to do. So consequently, from a telescope maker to an astrophotographer to a, a person who engineers and works with his hands to build his instruments, I know that he tests equipment at night. He does, because he writes the articles about new equipment. And sometimes when I am so lazy, sitting indoors, thinking, oh, do I really want to go outside, set that telescope up and look at Jupiter tonight, a little voice says, I'll bet Dennis DeChico's doing it. <laughs> and then I just get another beer and sit back and watch <laughs> the TV. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I've already seen way too much of myself tonight. Uh, in fact, I've developed a new sympathy for my wife. Uh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to tell her that when I get home. But um, at any rate, uh, as, as Rick started to joke, I've been at Sky and Telescope for a while. In, in, in fact, it's, uh, I think it's been 38 years now. And uh, there's a lot of humor that goes with that. And I promised myself I wasn't going to go there tonight. but. I changed my mind. Uh, I do want to tell one story. And, and uh, unlike many of my stories, this one's actually true. Um, but back when we were down on Bay State Road, um, uh, next door to us, there was some construction going on. And as I was walking to lunch one day, I kind of stopped and I looked at what was happening. And the foreman of the construction crew looked a little concerned that there was somebody standing on the street, kind of, you know, maybe he thought I was from the INS or something. But at any rate, he came over and he said, can I help you? And I turned to him and I said, oh, don't worry. I said, I, I actually have been work, working next door for a little more than 30 years, and I've taken a little interest in anything that happens in the neighborhood and everything. And he stopped and he looked at me for a second. And then he goes, 
30 years sounds more like a prison sentence than a job. <laughs> and I, I think that really did put it into perspective for me. But anyhow, during the last uh, 25 years or so of that time, I have been involved heavily with uh, uh, product coverage in the magazine, um, events that involve products, product reviews, um, new product announcements, our annual roundup of, of the hot new products and things like that. And uh, in, in case you missed it, David is interested in telescopes and things. And he, he said to me, he said, well, you can talk about some of the stuff that's happened in 70 years of Sky and Telescope. And it's true. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been in the hobby for a long time or a short period of time, but it is unbelievable the amount of changes that have taken place over the course of the years that Sky and Telescope has been published. And in fact, there's no better record of that than in the advertising that appears in the magazine. Um, because it's it's trends right there. You can see companies come and go. You can see the types of telescopes people were buying, how much they were spending for them, the new technology that's out there. It really is a fantastic uh, reference if you wanted to sit down and write the history of amateur astronomy and amateur equipment in the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, uh, we're coming up now on having published 72,000 pages of the magazine. And although the amount of advertising varies from issues to issues, um, more than 20,000 of those pages have been devoted to advertising. So you can imagine if you had a book with 20,000 pages in it, what kind of information would be there. So it's a little bit difficult to sort of even summarize that in a short time. So what I did is I decided to go back and, and look at a few things in the magazine, some sort of entertaining stuff. And it also follows a little bit of the history. Um, that was the cover of the first issue of the magazine. And this is the inside. And one ad that was there was for watches. Uh, a little bit later on, this was a 28-page issue, I believe. A little bit later on, there was an ad for a couple of companies, one that made a little star finder. And the other, how many people here are amateur astronomers and know about Astromart? You know about Astromart? You thought, think that's a new idea? Check this out. Telescope Mart, remember, this is the 1941 issue. And here it is. You know, they trade new and used telescopes right here in Watertown, Mass, of all places. Um, on the next page, there were two more ads for people that were selling basically lenses and parts for telescope makers. And a little bit later on, a couple of books. That was it. What's interesting about that is there are no ads in the magazine for new telescopes that you can purchase. And in fact, the issue, this is the very first ad in Sky and Telescope for a brand new telescope that you could buy as a new telescope being advertised. You're not going to believe this, I think, but that was in the 50th issue of Sky and Telescope. Published monthly, 50 issues. Now, it seems strange to say that, but the truth of the matter is, if you look back at what was happening, the first issue of Sky and Telescope rolled off the presses one month before Pearl Harbor. We were immediately thrust into World War II, and there was no one spending time making equipment for people to buy. And in fact, even the amateur telescope makers, a lot of them, some right here in Boston, got involved in the war effort, and they were making roof prisms that were used in gun sites. So for the fact that there were 48 issues that were taking place during the course of the war, there were no telescopes advertised, it sounds odd, but when you stop and think about the circumstances, it really wasn't. And in fact, some of the pages of Sky and Telescope had interesting things. You could see what was going on. They actually, uh, in one of the very earliest issues of the magazine, they ran a notice that had come out of the British War Office. And they were asking for anyone that owned a planisphere to send it to the British War Office so they could give it to the airplane spotters. Because by using a planisphere, they could figure out where the planes were and alert people as to where the attack was coming from. So it was interesting to follow the history there. Um, here's that um, Tinsley telescope. Here it is. This is the 4-inch uh, the, uh, model, I believe, that's illustrated. This was in a 1947 issue. Price had gone up. The 3-inch was now $265, $435 for a 4-inch telescope. Um, another thing that was interesting about the fact that it was after the war is in that same issue that that first telescope was advertised in, we had ads like this starting to show up. This was a company called Edmund Salvage. It turned into eventually Edmund Scientific. A lot of old timers may remember that. It's now Edmund Optics. It still exists. And they have a spin-off company called Scientifics that handles some other stuff. But this was an interesting aspect. After the war, there were surplus items that were out. 
Amateur astronomers were finding a little bit more leisure time after the war in the late 40s and early 50s. And of course, the dawn of the space age was on us. All these things contributed to a major growth in the hobby of astronomy. And of course, that was good news for sky and telescope. And it was reflected in the advertising. And in fact, a little bit later on, here's 1951. Here's a company called United Trading Company, which is bringing in refractors for sale. And uh, United Trading Company became known as Unitron. And here again, Old timers may remember that. That was quite a name. In fact, there's an interesting history about Unitron and its advertising in the magazine. Uh, a little bit later on, this is uh, 1953, there was an ad for Unitron Telescope. It was a little testimonial here, and it said, see the uh, back cover for more information. Two pages later, there's another ad for Unitron. Two pages later, there's yet another <laughs> ad for Unitron. And on the back cover, there was Unitron. Now, behind the scenes, Sky and Telescope was getting known as Sky and Unitron because <laughs> Unitron had this new idea of putting multiple ads in the magazine. Well, it actually caused a new policy to be created at the magazine where officially on our advertising rate card, it limited how much advertising any one advertiser could buy. I can't imagine that in this day and age. <laughs> Uh, and, in, and in fact, I, I, have to, I have to admit that our advertising sales manager is here, Peter Hardy. Put your hand up, Peter. Just, just, I want people to see who you are. When, when, I, when I run out of more creative ways to annoy him, I will, I will come down and say, you know, we ought to do what we used to do in limit advertising. Tell advertisers we're going to cut them off. They can't buy any more space. We used to do it. There's a precedent. Um, Unitron, they were on the back cover of the magazine for almost 20 years. Uh, these were like dream telescopes. People would look at these things, and you'd, you'd get that magazine, you'd pull it out of the cover, you'd, stand, you'd look at that back cover and go, oh, someday I'll own one of those. Uh, they were also very creative in their advertising. Here's one from the uh, 60s. You know, Johnny isn't watching the light show tonight. He's actually outside with a telescope. They were good. They had a really good advertising department and great ads. Um, and this is just a sign of the times. This, I believe, is in the uh, back cover of 1961. Here's a fellow with his Unitron and his cigarette. <laughs> so um, as I was flipping through the magazine looking for some old ads, this one caught my eye. Here's Lafayette Radio, anyone that may remember that. Up there, there's a $79 60 millimeter 2.4 inch refractor. And there I am in 1963 with mine. Uh, so now I, I did not get mine from Sky and Telescope advertising. I actually got mine from the Ra Lafayette radio catalog. Um, I still own the telescope. And here it is, matter of fact, just a couple of years ago. And I was actually out testing this piece of equipment. This is a, a 60 millimeter. It's the same size aperture telescope made by a company called Teleview. And uh, it, was, it was interesting because the Teleview would run circles around everything that that original Lafayette telescope would do, even in cases of high magnification. Plus, the Teleview, because of its short focal length, uh, could be used as a very wide-angle telescope, which the Lafayette couldn't. So it's one just indication of how things have come a long way. Furthermore, you could put the Unitron in a, I'm sorry, you could put the Teleview in a briefcase and take it with you any place you wanted to go. So it was a pretty cool telescope. Um, and then speaking of Teleview, uh, and David alluded to this. There have been a number of companies that have come and gone over the years, but there have been a number of companies that have started out with a single ad in Sky and Telescope, and they've grown to be juggernauts. And one of them is Teleview. And back in October of 1980, this was their first ad for telescope eyepieces. Now, that was a good size ad. That was a half-page ad. But nevertheless, that was the beginning of it. Today, they're a huge company. They make some of the world's finest refractors and certainly some of the finest eyepieces in the world. Um, this is what David was talking about. Remember when he said Geisler, Tim Geisler? There it is, Tim Geisler. He had a little tiny ad here for making a telescope drive control. This was a thing that would make the telescope speed up or slow down. Astrophotographers could use it. His company grew to become Orion Telescopes and Binoculars. It now is the world's largest mail order telescope business. Uh, another company that started out with a single ad in Sky and Telescope was in January 1964. It was uh, called Valor Electronics at the time. The telescope was called the Celestronic 20. Uh, Tom Johnson, who again uh, David alluded to, uh, 
started building schmidt cassegrain telescopes. In fact, a year earlier, he had had an article about one of the telescopes he built as an amateur that appeared in our magazine. It was actually the cover story. And he had gotten such response from that, he decided, gee, maybe I could make these things commercially. He owned an electronics company. So he was sort of in tune with the idea that advertising was important. So he started out with a very large full page ad. Uh, in the following issues, he shrunk it down to a very small ad. But they have gone along to become Celestron, which I think everybody he knows today. Uh, one other company that is a huge company in this day and age, of course, is Mead. And Mead began with a uh, three-quarter column ad in the magazine. John Diebel had borrowed $2,500 from his father-in-law, cleaned off half of the kitchen table in his little apartment in Cal Southern California, and began importing refractors from Japan and selling them with ads in Sky and Telescope. Today, they're Mead Instruments. Um, and then, of course, another well-known company is Questar. Uh, they first advertised in the mid-50s in Sky and Telescope, June 54, I think, might have been their first ad. Uh, a very, very coveted telescope. They don't advertise as much now, but they are still around. But when I saw this ad, it reminded me the things you can learn in Sky and Telescope. My god, women look through telescopes. <laughs> I was shocked to discover that. Because up until this point, I thought only men use telescopes. You could look at the ads and find out. I mean, there's a manly man with a manly man's telescope, if I ever saw one. <laughs> uh, I think this was a little bit more realistic, not only for the size of the telescope, but the type of guy looking through the telescope. <laughs> Unitron, they were on the cutting edge, but they weren't quite sure. So they decided, well, we'll put a guy and a woman using a telescope. <laughs> what I like is the woman is using the more advanced telescope. <laughs> Um, CAVE, they decided, hey, women sell telescopes. They're dressed for observing. <laughs> Go to another very long time advertiser in the magazine. I can't decide if that's a very small woman or a very large telescope. <laughs> but at any rate, it's a woman with a big telescope. And now we're getting to equality, because here we have a woman using a manly man's telescope. Um, there were some memorable. <laughs> There were some memorable ads in Sky and Tell, and, and I must admit, I do remember the stelloscope ads. Um, uh, and uh, you know, when I was looking through the magazine, I found this one. I went, oh, god, my memory's getting old, because it was another one I thought. And I went, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I, I like this one here. Read, read, read carefully. It says that this, if I find the button here, it says this six-inch telescope cost 280 bucks complete, as pictured above. <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute. All these features are included. I don't know if I was the only one. I don't suspect so. But we were reading the fine print to see exactly what was included with that deal. Um, there have been lots of telescopes that run all kinds of price ranges. Uh, here was a nice four inch. Was this the four or three inch? This may have been the three inch from Criterion, uh, a company in Connecticut that lasted for many years. 80 bucks, good price for a telescope. But I was a little bit intrigued by this one because this was on the inside front cover. This was in 1957, I believe. And it was $198.50. And this was a good telescope for the day. It was a four inch aperture on a good solid mount. And it had a clock drive, had an electric drive for it, which was, that was high tech. That was about as high tech as you were going to get on an amateur telescope. Well, if you take a look at the consumer price index, and you go from 57 to 2011, that's a factor of almost eight. So that $198 telescope back in 57 is the equivalent of 1,500 bucks today. So I thought, what could you do with 1,500 bucks? Well, how about we go for an eight inch reflector, not a four inch, an eight inch, We'll put it on a nice mount with a, an electric drive. And furthermore, it has computer pointing. Press a few buttons, the telescope will automatically point at one. What's it cost? About half of what that other, the Fekker telescope cost. You can also spend about half that much and get a 12-inch reflector. Talk about big aperture now. Um, for that still less than 1,500 bucks, you can get a 12-inch Dobsonian today. This isn't go to. It doesn't have motors to go automatically. It's a push to, but it has a little computer. You just push the telescope till the little numbers line up and you're pointed at the object. You want to spend a little bit more than the 1500, you can do that in a 14 inch telescope. Uh, want to go back to the Tinsley? Remember this telescope from 1947? It's a four inch refractor, 435 bucks. 
435 bucks today, 4,300 plus dollars. You can simply imagine what you can get for 4,300 bucks. Now, it's, it's true that that's, that's what the cost difference or what it equates to. I'll tell you, I'm not ready to run out today and drop 4,000 bucks on a telescope. So I decided to flip the coin a little bit. Uh, well, wait a minute, I've got one more slide in here. That $4,000, here's $2,500. We now have a 14 inch, this is a go-to. This has got, press the buttons, it's got motor drive, it goes to. Um, and then if you want to even spend less, you can get the 12-inch version over here. But I started to say I wanted to flip the coin. Uh, this is a 4-inch refractor. In fact, I just got done reviewing this telescope. It's reviewed in the December of the issue of the magazine, which has just come out. Um, I'll tell you right now, even though I have not looked through that Tinsley telescope from 1947, this one's better. I mean, this one has excellent optics in it. It's got some very nice features. You can use wide field eyepieces. Now, it's only the telescope tube here. You don't really get this mount with it, but you get the rings and the other parts. This telescope costs today $499. Flip that backwards, that's 50 bucks in 1947. So if today, you can buy this telescope in 1947. 47, one not as good, instead of paying 50 back then, was $400. It shows you just how good equipment has gotten. Um, now, as much as I like good deals and bargains and stuff like that, I'm going to have to tell you something. Astronomy is one of the cool hobbies. You don't have to spend any money on it. You really can enjoy it. And I've said that to people, and they look at me and go, yeah, 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 you're the guy with a great big backyard observatory. And over the course of the years, I've probably spent the equivalent of two or three brand new cars on astronomy equipment. But I really do practice what I preach. Um, my wife sometimes, when she can't find me in the house in the evening, she'll know I might be lying out on the grass in the front yard or out on the back deck just looking at the sky. Naked eye, not even binoculars. I really do enjoy it. And you can enjoy astronomy that way. This was a moonrise in Boston. You can go out and look at that. Uh, with your naked eye, you can go enjoy meteors in the sky, just enjoy the beauty of it. Um, and even on a winter's evening, no matter how cold it is outside, if it's clear, I'll stop, I'll look at the stars, I'll see the moon, I'll see stuff reflected in the snow. It really is a beautiful hobby that you don't have to spend any money on to enjoy. Well, maybe, maybe not no money. You should really have a subscription to Sky and Tell. Uh, but beyond that, you don't have to have more. So thank you very much. <laughs> so. For our last presenter tonight, I, wanted to, I want to introduce to you Bob Noya. I met Bob, must have been mid-90s. I have been called out to Waukesha. There is another magazine in astronomy called Brand A. Brand A. And for some odd reason, I was interviewing for the editorship of it. And I realized that that was not going to be part of my life. But when I was there, I met a young writer. We had dinner together that night. And I really liked him. He was bright. He uh, talked astronomy the way I understood astronomy. And so I realized that even though it was Waukesha, Wisconsin, there was a kindred spirit out there and a friend. And I hope that someday you never know that it comes back and you get to work with people in a different way. Uh, he went on to uh, be the editor of Mercury Magazine and published two books on astronomy and then came here to work for Sky and Telescope. And then before I knew it, he was the new editor in chief. I can't say how happy that makes me. It's interesting how life does that to you. And now I would like to introduce to you to talk about the future of Sky and Telescope magazine, Bob Noya. Thanks, David. Can everybody hear me okay in the back? Okay, great. Well, I want to first start off uh, by giving a very hearty thank you to uh, David and his colleague, Christine Pulliam, for an. Uh, we re really appreciate uh, having us here tonight and inviting us to speak and uh, making us part of your uh, monthly observatory night program. And I want to thank all of, you, uh, all of you who came tonight to hear us talk. And I also want to just say, I, as I mentioned in the video, want to thank all of the people who worked over the years at Sky and Telescope 
who really helped build it up into this really great institution and made, made it what it is today. You know, the people who work there right now are definitely standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, to talk a little bit about the present first, uh, how many of you, by the way, in the room here are S&T subscribers? I feared we'd had a pretty good number of subscribers here, uh, but I see a lot of people who are not. We did bring copies, by the way, of our 70th anniversary issue. So if, you're not, if you don't have one, I hope you can, uh, pick, uh, can pick one up either tonight or if we run out, uh, maybe pick one up on the newsstand. Uh, so right now we have about 70,000 subscribers. We average about 10,000 sales uh, per month on the newsstand. And one thing we, we've always seen ourselves, at least in the last several decades, as an international magazine. I don't have the exact count, but I know that right now we have subscribers in more than 100 countries. Uh, most of our subscribers are intermediate and advanced amateur astronomers. Uh, besides Sky and Telescope, we produce our website. We certainly, if you haven't visited, visited it before, to visit skyandtelescope.com. And you know, I, I'm a little bashful here to kind of toot our own horn, but you know, from talking to amateur astronomers and professionals, I think it's pretty still fair and accurate to say that we remain the most pop respected popular astronomy magazine in the world. Uh, if you're not familiar with the magazine, uh, Alan really, uh, I thought, covered this very succinctly in the video. We really cover an incredibly wide range of topics. There's just a huge amount of material that kind of falls under the umbrella of astronomy. I mean, we'll cover things related to particle physics all the way to equipment, and as, and Al, as Alan said, things like binocular mounts and building telescopes. Really a very wide range of uh, things we cover in the magazine. So our editorial staff, we have, you know, we have a really tremendous range of expertise among the editors. Because believe me, there's no one in the whole world who like, knows everything about astronomy. It's just too big a field. Uh, who writes for Sky and Telescope? Of course, we have our staff editors, people like myself, Alan, Dennis. We have former editors like Rick Feinberg as an editorial on our focal point uh, department in our latest uh, 70th anniversary issue. We have our contributing and senior contributing editors like Kelly and Roger who write for us and really outstanding writers such as Sue French, uh, Fred Schaff, and Gary Saronic. We get a lot of pitches from amateur astronomers, freelance writers, uh, amateur telescope makers, scientists, historians. We get writers from many different walks of life. And if any of you are interested in writing uh, for Sky and Telescope and have an idea that you want to share um, with, other, with other people interested in astronomy, uh, send us a letter or write us an email, more likely the latter. And I want to also mention we don't just produce Sky and Telescope. We do a lot of other things as well. And this is just really a small sample of what else we do. Uh, for uh, the last dozen years or so, we've produced an annual issue called Skywatch that I think does a really great job of covering a whole year's worth of astronomy and gives a lot of introductory articles about astrophotography, how to observe the planets, phases of the moon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this year's edition uh, was really, to some extent, a one-man show. I want to recognize my colleague, Tony Flanders, who did the lion's share of the work with this and did a really great job. This, I, I think, is now out on newsstands, and you can certainly order it from our Shop at Sky website. Uh, this one just went to press about two weeks ago. It's not yet out, but it'll be out in just a few weeks. And that's our annual Beautiful Universe um, uh, magazine. This is usually a very uh, popular seller. Uh, it's out, of course, around the Christmas season. And this, this magazine features the best astrophotography. It's a combination of uh, uh, photos from amateur astronomers, a professional telescopes, spacecraft. So it's a wide range. But in general, we really try to um, feature the, uh, and highlight astrophotography from amateurs from all over the world. And uh, this year's edition is particularly beautiful. Um, the main driving force behind our edition this year was our imaging editor, Sean Walker, who uh, unfortunately, because he lives uh, up in Manchester, New Hampshire, is not here tonight. But uh, he and our art director, Pat Coppola, did a wonderful job. We also produce uh, the Pocket Sky Atlas, which uh, Roger uh, was, and our, our, my colleague Greg Dinderman here were the driving forces behind this. 
Uh, this actually just came out with a new edition just about two or three months ago. So if you have an old edition, there were a few things that we've corrected and updated. In, uh, so you might want to consider buying the new edition. And this book, I'm very proud of this book. This just literally came out a couple weeks ago, uh, written by our contributing editor, Sue French, who will be here next month on, on, on November 7th. And uh, she's November 3rd. OK, she will be here November 3rd. And she's been writing for Sky and Telescope for many years. Uh, her current column, which runs in every month, is called Deep Sky Wonders. It's one of the most popular departments in the magazine. And working with her and with Firefly Books in uh, Toronto, Canada, we've come out with a new book that's a collection of her 100 most famous uh, favorite essays in Sky and Telescope, 25 per season. It's a beautifully illustrated book. You can either use it as a field guide, a manual for a star hopping, great sky tours, or it's a wonderful coffee table book as well, which is beautiful photography and illustrations throughout the book. Uh, for I think many of you know, uh, about a year ago, we came out with our DVD archive, the complete sky and telescope uh, seven decade collection where every issue of Sky and Telescope from 1941 through 2009 is on these, uh, uh, on these DVDs. And it has, also has um, a disk with a searchable index. And Dennis uh, DeChico was the driving force behind this, along with his daughter, Hannah, who works in our marketing department. And they did just a tremendous job putting that together. And as I mentioned in the video, we also a few months ago came out with our first app, Sky Week. And this is free to download. It works on both uh, Apple and uh, Droid mobile devices. And uh, I certainly encourage you to, uh, if you have one, to, to try it out. Uh, it can't beat the price. So I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing right now. And I thought the best way to do that would be to uh, do it through the uh, eyes of, of the people who work on the magazine staff right now. Of course, this is me. Uh, when I showed this picture to the staff earlier today, there, there was a little <coughs> bit of complaint that it's about a 10-year-old photo. But it's hard to beat this spot in Yosemite National Park overlooking Half Dome as a place to do astronomy. This is a picture taken when I was working as editor of Mercury Magazine in San Francisco and fairly regularly going to weekends to Yosemite for their weekend star parties. Uh, so uh, as was mentioned earlier, I became editor-in-chief in, -chief in uh, June 2008. Um, I commission and edit most of the science and history features, but certainly uh, with a lot of help from the rest of the staff. I write the uh, spectrum, the editor's column, and I edit the uh, two other departments, Focal Point and Cosmic Relief. And of course, I work with the editorial and art staffs uh, to uh, you know, kind of establish the overall direction of the magazine. I try not to run the magazine like a, like a dictator. We really make a lot of our decisions by group consensus. And somehow, we manage to all still get along with each other. Um, but I do make the ultimate decision on manuscripts setting the article lineup uh, for each issue, and also uh, working with Pat on the cover story. I'm also the last person to see an article before it gets sent off to the printer. So I try to read every, every article before it goes to the printer and catch every little miss comma or misspelling. I don't claim to catch it all, but hopefully I, I catch most of them. And of course, I also work with uh, the publishing company and marketing departments. I think you've all gotten to know Dennis a little bit tonight. Uh, he, as he mentioned, he's worked at S&T since 1974. He helps also write and edit a variety of articles on astrophotography history. And right now, he's working on the Hot Products article, the big eight-page uh, article that runs in every January issue. But for me, his most important role at Sky and Telescope is I'm often too busy, really, to go out and get lunch. I kind of work through lunch. And uh, Dennis has been going to a restaurant. Really, you know, it's only, it's only about a mile from here near the Fresh Pond traffic circle called Mama Goose. And Dennis, how long have you been going to Mama Goose? 38 years. 38 years he's been going to Mama Goose. So, uh, and you know, this was that, like today. He, uh, right before he leaves to walk to Mama Goose, he tells me he's heading over. I call them up, uh, place an order. I tell him Dennis the Menace. 
is coming to pick up my lunch and uh, he brings it back for me and I actually do pay him back for it. Uh, but that's actually for me, that's his most important role at Sky and Telescope. <laughs> Uh, this, I just want to show you Dennis's home observatory out in Sudbury. And Dennis, by the way, he's, been, you know, he's a mo pretty modest guy, but he was the first person ever to take a successful picture of the analemma. That's the path that the sun traces uh, throughout the year. That was actually done, I guess, in the early 1970s, correct? Okay, and uh, Alan is here in the front row. Uh, he's worked at Sky Intel since uh, 1982. I call him the Mr. Versatility because I can give him pretty much any assignment on any topic and he'll do a really great job with the article. Uh, he produces our uh, monthly news notes department which is mostly science news but he also does a celestial calendar, our planetary almanac and he can do science history and observing features. Uh, he writes uh, our column for our website, This Week Sky to Glance. That's actually the basis for our Sky Week app. And that's actually, that generates a lot of hits every week. And he also helps produce our sky maps. Uh, this is a picture taken a number of years ago at his home observatory out in Bedford. And I want to uh, mention Tony again here, our associate editor. Uh, he's been at S&T since 2003. He actually came aboard at about the same time I did. Uh, the company at the time was expanding to also produce Night Sky magazine. I call him our urban astronomer. He lives and does much of observing from right here in Cambridge. Uh, he edits uh, most of our regular observing features, including Sue French's uh, Deep Sky Wonders column. And he also runs our website, which is you know, a very thankless job that he, he uh, does quite willingly. And we really appreciate his work on that. He produces uh, sky maps and also edits uh, our, sky, our annual Skywatch issue. And that's Tony out in Danahee, Danahee Park, not very far from here, on a cold night observing. And he's able to see stuff from, uh, from a light polluted environment that I don't think uh, you know, a lot of people wouldn't be able to see. <laughs> and unfortunately, because you know, Sean has a, a long way to commute from Manchester, and he had to pick up his daughter after work today. He's not with us. Uh-oh. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, so I'll, yep. So uh, this is our imaging editor, Sean Walker, who uh, joined Sky and Telescope's production department in 2000. And then he became an official editor on 2000, in 2004. And he's our resident astrophotographer. He basically edits our astrophotography section gallery, our astrophotography feature article. And he also uh, selects and writes the product reviews for new product showcases. Um, and uh, he processes many of the images that appear in, beautiful, in uh, Sky and Tell. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, he edits Beautiful Universe. Here's just an example of some of Sean's work. This is a movie of Venus shot over a, a number of weeks several years ago. And the, this was actually shot through an ultraviolet feature. And here we're seeing actual cloud features in the upper atmosphere of Venus. And you can see it's sort of rotating the wrong way. That's because uh, Venus uh, rotates in a retrograde direction opposite the direction of its orbit around the sun. And uh, you know, as far as I know, I've never seen any other astronomer take a, a movie quite like this, showing this much detail in the atmosphere. And a couple years ago, when, when Mars was at opposition, and you can actually see one of the moons here, that's probably Phobos, you can actually see uh, this beautiful rotation movie of Mars. And these are all pictures taken and processed by Sean. And uh, really, there's Certus Major here. And this is a really spectacular photo uh, that Sean took of the moon and the Veil, uh, yeah, the Veil Nebula. <clears throat> and this is actually a collaboration between Dennis and Sean. This is uh, Dennis's house out, out near Sudbury. And they worked on this project to do a really wide angle a, 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 a image a mosaic of the night sky where Dennis shot this through an H alpha filter and then gave the files to Sean, who using you know, advanced photo processing techniques was able to combine this into a really, really beautiful mosaic. We actually have a giant poster of this that hangs on our offices. And I want to mention, too, if any of you are ever interested in visiting us, 
you know, we, we always like to have visitors. We're literally less than one mile from here. If you just, you know, go down to the uh, exit of uh, the Center for Astrophysics, turn left on Garden Street, veer right at the um, uh, fire station and go down Sherman Street, just go down to 90 Sherman Street in that big red brick office building, and there we are. It's literally only about a 10 minute walk from here. Uh, and I want to uh, welcome a new editor to our staff, Camille Carlisle, who started on Tuesday of this week. Uh, we're very happy to have her. She actually worked for us for about three months in 2008 as an editorial intern. Uh, we were very happy with her work. We knew we wanted to get her back at some point, and we were able to do so uh, when just starting up earlier this week. Uh, she uh, comes to us after, uh, after leaving S&T. She did, uh, went through the MIT science journalism program and then went on to science news, and now she's returning to us. And we don't know exactly how we're, you know, we're still kind of getting started and defining all of her responsibilities, but she's going to be doing a lot of writing for the magazine and website. In fact, today I got her going on a sidebar for an article running in, in an upcoming issue. And I, don't, I definitely want to mention, especially because she wasn't in the video today, our art director, our official title design director, uh, Pat Coppola. Uh, she designs most of Sky and Telescope with help from Greg. She designs the covers. Uh, she works with me, although I mainly let her set the deadlines for the editors. It doesn't mean that the editors actually meet their deadlines, uh, but she actually sets the deadlines. Uh, she manages the art department. Uh, works with freelance artists, and she also uh, uh, creates uh, occasional illustrations as well. Uh, these are just some of the covers she's designed in, uh, over the last couple years, and just an example of one of her uh, designs for an opening spread about, uh, about Galileo that we ran a few years ago. And my colleague uh, Greg Dindermans in the, in the th third row here with his wife Michelle. He's our illustration director. Uh, what, what year did you start at S&T, Greg? 95, so Greg's been with us for uh, 16 years. Uh, he designs features and departments for Sky and Tell. Uh, he creates illustrations and star maps for S&T, the website and special issues. He also works with Pat on setting deadlines. And Greg did a really fabulous job working with Tony this year on designing our annual issue, Skywatch. And these are, this is an example of one of Greg's designs. Uh, I should mention this illustration here was by our former illustrator, Casey Reed, who uh, came on board ar around the same time I did in 2003. One of the, I think one of the, the premier space artists in the world. Um, he served in the Massachusetts National Guard and about a little over a year ago, his unit was deployed to Afghanistan. So he lost Casey um, and when he, d he returned, we were gonna bring him back but he lives actually pretty far away from here, out in Pepperell, and decided to take a job closer to home. So we do miss him, but uh, we're, we're still doing, uh, I think, very well with illustrations. Uh, here are a couple other illustrations that Greg created. This one here is kind of the planetary defense an analog of the Torino scale, judging uh, the hazard, how hazardous a particular a uh, near-Earth asteroid would be, especially it gets higher and higher up on the scale if it's going to cause, like, you know, global catastrophe. Let's hope in the near future we don't have any tens on the Torino scale. Uh, Greg does a lot of our, sky, our uh, uh, sky maps. And we have another illustrator who joined us when Casey left for Afghanistan, uh, Leah Tishioni. So she joined us last year. Uh, she creates illustrations and sky maps for s and the website and special issues. Uh, she's previously worked for the New York Post. In fact, she's still on a freelance basis, uh, contributes to the Post, including occasional cover illustrations or char characterizations of uh, caricatures of politicians are, uh, I think, particularly uh, creative and amusing. And this is a diagram she did actually for the December issue and a feature article about the upcoming Mars rover. And these are some of the other illustrations she's done for S&T. This is an article about Frankenstein in our 70th anniversary issue. This was an article that appeared earlier this year about Hulse the Planets. And this is an article, uh, illustration and article that ran last year about the cosmology of the great ancient Greek scientist Archimedes. 
And I also, of course, want to mention Shweta, who you met earlier, uh, who comes to us from Chennai, India. Uh, she's worked at S&T since April. We're very happy to have her on our staff. Uh, and the video you saw tonight is not the only video she's produced for Sky and Tell. If you go to our website, uh, she's produced a number of other videos as well, including uh, portraits of most of the editorial staff on Sky and Tell. She's also cranking out news stories for the website and magazine. And she recently uh, graduated from the Boston University science journalism program, which also produced me and our senior contributing editor, Kelly Beattie. So Boston University has kind of been a feedy, feeder uh, to feed uh, staff, uh, staff members to Sky and Telescope. Uh, I want to talk just briefly about the future of s &T. Obviously, this is going to be uh, bound up with the internet and electronic media. I don't think this is uh, any secret here that the internet is profoundly changing pu uh, publishing. Uh, information is usually, actually I should have put the word usually there, free for users, uh, but, but it can be just as expensive to produce if you want to get the facts right. One nice thing is that mistakes are easy to correct. If we have, let's say, a misspelling on a web story, unlike print where it goes to pre you know, press and it's there forever, you can go back into our CMS and fix the mistake. It makes it easy to cover breaking news and do it in a very timely manner. So if there's a new extrasolar planet discovered, you read about it in the newspaper, and then Sky and Tell might come out a month later. Well, now we can cover it at the same time as everyone else. We can send out email alerts about important Sky events, which we do. We have bonus audio and video content for the magazine that doesn't cost us any extra money. Uh, I think sometimes, as we saw, a movie can be worth a, a thousand still pictures. And of course, with our Facebook and Twitter, you know, there's uh, user-provided content and social networking. Some of the disadvantages, and that I certainly find this true with myself, is that computer screens aren't conducive to concentrated, focused attention. There's definitely something actually David and I uh, talked about um, uh, before, before uh, the talk started is it's really led to, I think, somewhat of an erosion in the quality of science journalism. David mentioned that a lot of the press releases that he and Christine write for a CFA end up appearing all over the world on websites and other media verbatim. Uh, and it's really that there should be reporters out there who report on stories and, and you know, make sure that the facts are accurate, try to get the full story. Um, I experienced the same thing. I worked for a year at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center writing press releases, and uh, I noticed the same thing. And I actually find that a little bit uh, you know, worrisome about the future, especially because I don't think this is limited just to science communication. Um, the pressure for quick posting and this ease of correction can lead to a little bit of sloppiness. I know uh, the, when I've been writing news stories for the website, you know, you feel the pressure to get it out as soon as possible. And sometimes that means you don't have time to check all the facts or consult independent sources. One of the problems I think that, you know, I, it's, I don't think I'm uh, breaking any news here, is it's difficult to generate revenue on the internet, especially when people expect free content. Uh, so many people are going to the internet for astronomy information. And you know, the quality of websites out there really varies. There's very good ones out there, but the information is not always reliable. Uh, so just to kind of conclude before I get to the final section, uh, we've recently made s and available as a digital subscription. We're going to soon have it available. Uh, if you're a print subscriber, you'll get a free subscription for a mobile device such as iPhones, iPods, iPads, and Droid devices. We recently developed the uh, Sky Week app. We're soon going to be moving into television. My colleague Tony will be playing a very prominent role in that. Uh, but as Dennis alluded to in this video, the future course of this internet and electronic delivery is difficult to predict. And to conclude, I want to just say a few words about the evolving partnership between amateur and professional astronomers. Um, because there's now these large professional sky surveys, for example, Sloan, Tumas, and others, it's getting more difficult for amateurs to make contributions in some of their traditional areas of past success, such as comet and asteroid discoveries, 
but amateurs are now doing things that you know really they weren't doing a decade ago, such as monitoring really detailed brightness changes in asteroids. This is actually an asteroid light curve. It's very, how it varies in brightness over time. From a good friend of mine out in California named Bob Stevens, they're doing you know light curves for Kuiper Belt objects, which is helping uh, astronomers refine their sizes, shapes, rotation rates, whether they're single or binary. There's members of the club that meets every week here at, at Phillips Auditorium, the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, who within the past year had a paper with MIT astronomers published in Nature, this very prestigious science journal uh, published in England about their work about an, uh, a Kuiper Belt object uh, occulting a distant star. Um, and also with CCD cameras and spectrometers with an improving technology, there's all sorts of exciting new parameter space opening up for amateur contributions in many different fields. You know, still variable star observing, and I should mention uh, the uh, AAVSO, who is now in our former building at 49 Bay State Road. Just about a week ago, they celebrated their 100th anniversary. We had a, a, a long feature article in our uh, October issue about the history of the AAVSO. Astronomers have also, I think, really amazing, have contributed to the, to the discovery and characteriza characterization of dozens of extrasolar planets, planets orbiting other stars. That was something that nobody would have expected, let's say, 20 years ago. And so to conclude, uh, there's another a tremendous uh, uh, developing area of potential, and that's uh, what are called crowdsourced data mining web projects. And we feature the most famous of all of these projects, Galaxy Zoo, in, in the cover story of our November issue. There's another one that's really a, getting popular called Planet Hunters. And just a few weeks ago, it was announced that amateur astronomers mining the data from Planet Hunters helped discover an extrasolar uh, uh, planet. So I think such citizen science projects are going to become increasingly fruitful, especially as new professional surveys come online. So it's, uh, Sky Intel has always covered a lot of amateur science projects. And this is something that will remain a very important staple of our coverage uh, for, I think, a long time to come. So uh, thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs>